President Baird, I'm uh, grateful that you've announced we have 25 grandchildren. That means the married children will have to get busy since we only have 18. <clears throat> Unless you know something that I don't know, which could be the case. I'm grateful that Brother Winter, Rich, Rich Winter and I have been great friends for many, many years. I often think of his visit to me as a young man when I was serving in England as a missionary and he had completed his mission in Czechoslovakia. In fact, had uh, he, along with uh, all of the missionaries, had been uh, asked to leave that country. And on their way back home, they stopped to visit me in England, and that goes back over 30 years. We have been very dear friends uh, in a study group uh, all of these years, meeting once a month with he and his good wife, Barbara. Grateful that they're here with us tonight. Deeply grateful to have Brother McConkie, who's your regional representative, one of your other regional representatives. He and I go back a lot uh, further than any of us, either one of us would care to admit tonight, going back to our high school days at East High School, and we're so proud of him and the great work that he is doing. I'd like to express the appreciation to your stake presidents and their wives who sit here on the stand, and I'm always pleased to be in the presence of President and Sister Holland. I think you students, if you don't already know it, let me assure you from the point of my point of view that you are abundantly blessed to be led by this good man. I thought perhaps you'd be interested a little bit in some of the things that have happened in my life in the last few months. On Thursday morning, October the 10th, 1985, in the fourth floor council room of the Salt Lake Temple, I was invited to sit on a small stool placed at the feet of President Spencer W. Kimball, who sat in a chair. With President Kimball's hands on my head, surrounded in a circle by President Hinckley and all of the members of the Council of the Twelve, I was ordained an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ and set apart as a member of the Council of the Twelve. President Hinckley was voice. I was given a blessing that is a great source of comfort and strength to me. To say the least, my brothers and sisters, I was then and still am now overwhelmed with this calling to serve as a special witness of the Lord Jesus Christ and to serve you, the members of the Church. In 1974, President Kimball called me to preside over the Canada-Toronto Mission. He also called me to serve as a member of the First Quorum of the Seventy in 1976. It is very special to me to know that the last priesthood ordinance he participated in before passing was my ordination to the Holy Apostleship. I have a deep love and respect for our beloved President Kimball. He will always hold a very special place in the hearts of my wife, Barbara, our children, and myself, as I know that he must do in each of your hearts. As I have relived this most meaningful experience in my life over and over again, I have asked myself the question which I believe almost everyone asks when called to serve in the Church. Why me, Lord? The privilege of serving as a member of the First Quorum of the Seventy for the past nine and one-half years has taken me to many parts of the earth on errands for the Lord. I believe I know, as well as anyone in the Church, that there are thousands, 
of faithful and devoted men and women who serve the Lord with their whole soul and serve, serve Him with great distinction. Knowing, as I do, that there are many men worthy and capable of such a sacred calling as mine, the question, why me, has had a sobering impact upon my own soul. I have, during the past three months, come to the comforting knowledge that the Lord and my brethren see in me something that I can do to help the work of the Lord continue to move forward. In my specific case, I am also aware that the dedicated service of many of my forefathers could well have influenced my call to the Council of the Twelve. Since the very beginnings of the restoration of the Church, they gave all that they had, even their very lives, for this great work. Family members of the Prophet Joseph Smith and his brother Hiram have served in the Council of the Twelve since the organization of the Council of the Twelve in 1835. I count it a blessing to be a representative now of the family of Joseph and Hiram and acknowledge publicly that to follow my great-grandfather, Joseph F. Smith, and both of my grandfathers, Hiram Mack Smith and Melvin J. Ballard, into the Council of the Twelve Apostles is a great honor and responsibility. I will do my very best to be the kind of servant that is worthy of such a birthright. On several occasions, I have been assured by my brethren that they felt my forefathers must have sustained my call in the councils on the other side, as well as the First Presidency in the Council of the Twelve on this side of the veil. But how is it that a call to serve in the Church comes into the lives of the sons and daughters of God. Let me explore this with you for a few moments. To begin with, I am sure that our behavior in the pre-mortal world had a great deal to do with our birthright here upon the earth. I do not pretend to understand the whole process but I have come to a comfortable, comfortable assurance in my own heart that to be born in a land that is free, where men and women can worship God through the dictates of their own feelings and conscience, is a great blessing. As you know, in many countries of this world today, a meeting such as this one could never be held. The blessings of the abundance of physical convenience of life that every one of us enjoy is overwhelming when we compare our abundant life to the struggle for survival that is ever present in many parts of the earth. 1985 took me twice to the vast continent of Africa, where I walked among the people and observed firsthand their terrible suffering. For example, the value of a tent placed on bare earth to shield the children of God from the cold night winds of the desert and the scorching heat of the day has a new and impactful meaning to me that is very difficult to express to you in words. You and I have a bed with a mattress and bedding to sleep on. We have hot and cold running water at our command. We have sanit sanitation facilities to help control disease and sickness of all kinds. Our homes are heated and some are air conditioned. Many of us have comfortable automobiles in which to travel. The question could well be asked, how in the plan of our Heavenly Father do some of His children have so much, while others have so little? One answer for us who are sitting here tonight 
is found in this mandate from the Lord, quote, For of him unto whom much is given, much is required, unquote. God the Father and Jesus Christ his Son have every right to expect much from you and me. In the great plan of salvation, all of the children of our Heavenly Father in the premortal world, by their own choice and agency, elected to follow the Lord rather than Lucifer. By this choice, we earn the right to receive a physical body of flesh and bones. The blessing of our mortal body perhaps will not be fully understood until we pass from this life into the next one. We know, however, that to receive this physical body is absolutely essential in order to dwell in the presence of God and His Christ forever and ever. By our mortal life, we can experience the testing process of exercising our free agency. The right to make our own choices is essential to our preparation to celestial living in the presence of God. We learn by this process to either love and embrace the teachings and commandments of the gospel of Jesus Christ or to follow the temptings and the enticements of the devil. Every human soul makes hundreds of choices daily, and when these are compounded and totaled, they will determine our eternal destiny. Never forget that one of life's most important choices is to repent and to turn away from evil, to embrace gospel standards. This process is part of the great plan of life. In our case, as members of the true Church of Jesus Christ, we have the perfect standard or guideline for knowing how to choose the right way to live in mortality. The gospel of Jesus Christ with its teachings and commandments leading to eternal life is what we must choose to follow. We are blessed while living in mortality to have both a physical body and spirit joined together. In this state of our existence, we are on the road to becoming as our Father in heaven. For he said after the fall of Adam, quote, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. The prophet Alma explains the great experience of mortality as a probationary state or existence. Let me quote from him. And we see that death comes upon mankind, yea, the death which has been spoken of by Amulek, which is the temporal death. Nevertheless, there was a space granted unto man in which he might repent. Therefore, this life became a probationary state, a time to prepare to meet God, a time to prepare for that endless state which has been spoken of, a, spoken of by us, which is after the resurrection of the dead." Unquote. And so, we are here in mortality with a physical body and the Spirit united to help us work out our own salvation. The Spirit within each one of us must learn to bring our body under subjection. By the power of our Spirit, we must bring ourselves under the control of the commandments and teachings of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We should always remember that to die without embracing the gospel and living its commands will only complicate our eternal progress. Because it is far easier to repent and change while living in this probationary state. Oh, my young people, do not suppose 
that your desires and appetites will change because you die. We will surely rise from the grave with the same desires and habits that were present upon our internment to the grave. Therefore, as Alma pled, quote, And now, my brethren, I wish from the inmost part of my heart, yea, with great anxiety, even unto pain, that ye would hearken unto my words and cast off your sins and not procrastinate the day of your repentance." Unquote. The challenges to live in the world are great. In many ways, these challenges are more difficult for you young people today than they were when I was your age. In a recent issue of a national magazine, the whole issue of morality was examined. Let me quote from that article. The Pentagon launches an investigation of 45 of the nation's top 100 defense contractors for bribery, kickbacks, false claims, bid rigging, bid rigging and overcharges. A stock brokerage firm pleads guilty to defrauding banks of tens of millions of dollars and is fined $2 million. Major student cheating scandals are disclosed at Stanford University, the University of California at Berkeley, and the University of Southern California. The article continues. Professional baseball players admit to using cocaine. A major point-shaving scandal hits the Tulane University basketball squad, and several other schools are cited for recruiting violations. Kickbacks to the Salvation Army officials are admitted by two Philadelphia exporters who said they sought favored treatment in purchasing used clothes from the charitable organization. A New York socialite whose ancestors go back to the Mayflower pilgrims is set free with a token fine after confessing that she ran a million dollar a year prostitution ring. I'm just highlighting from this article, but I want to continue. Gambling used to be widely condemned. Now many more churches run bingo games, and 22 states and the District of Columbia operate lotteries. Drinking used to be widely condemned. Now nearly two-thirds of Americans drink at least occasionally. The U.S. News poll showed that 20 percent of the young adults have tried cocaine, and half of those under 30 have smoked marijuana. Attorney General Edwin Meese cited the nation's 24 million cocaine users and warns a national disaster is in the making. Continuing, premarital sex used to be widely condemned. Today it is commonplace, although many still consider it a moral lapse. Federal statistics show that about half of the women who married during the early 1960s said they had sex before their weddings. Now more than four-fifths, four-fifths, report they had sexual experience. On average, U.S. girls have their first sexual intercourse at age 16, boys at 15 and a half. Premarital sex is seen as part of discovery. The article continues in summary. Notes a woman college student at Northwestern University, quote, there has to be concern about birth control and getting an education before people engage in premarital sex. But it's not wrong. It's perfectly natural." Unquote. A recent Yale University study for Psychology Today of 7,500 readers showed that 45 percent of the women 
as well as 45% of the men said they had cheated on their spouses. The article goes on. For some, honesty depends on the circumstances. As a sociologist, Seymour Martin Lipset of Stanford University observes, everybody lies. But the question is, to what extent do you conscientiously deceive others? Do you exaggerate to impress a girl or a guy? Do you fudge on your curriculum vita to impress an employer? Do you twist the truth to succeed in your job? No one knows whether the truth is more twisted today than in the past, but some scholars think it is. Lying allows many people to excuse dishonesty on the grounds that it does not matter whether or not we lie when we have a good reason for doing so. A major legal ethical dilemma for Americans is abortion. Before 1973, it was illegal in most states and practiced sub rosa. Today, it is legal in most cases, widely practiced, and under furious attack. And the article continued, teen pregnancy has become so acute that groups across the nation are trying to combat it. Cheating, stealing, and lying at work have really popped to the surface since the recession of early 1980s. Honesty tests for job applicants show that three of every 10 prospective retail workers admit stealing from a previous employer. Teaching values has always been a cooperative effort by the family and the social institutions, the article declares. Now you have TV instead. But it is hard to see what moral values, if any, are taught by TV. The institutions where moral values are usually reinforced have fallen apart. Frank Newman, president of edu the Education Commission of the States, says that by the time the typical student graduates from high school, he or she has spent more hours with TV, 15,000, than with teachers, 12,000. End of quotation. What is the impact of television shows that present violence, killings, sex, the image of wealth, the power of money? Do you suppose Who do you suppose is influencing the producers and the writers of such programming? Surely Satan has his hand in this programming. As our Heavenly Father and the Lord Jesus Christ observe how you and I live our lives in this present environment, as they see how we deal with the struggle between good and evil, as they come to know us, to trust us with the work of leading their church. We demonstrate every day that we are learning to choose the right and to, and to depart from the evil. Through this process, we are preparing to meet and to live with God. The power of revelation from God to man is the way the Lord reveals His will to His servants. The process of extending calls to members to serve in the Church is a process of revelation. If you are true and faithful to the teachings and commandments of the gospel, if you repent and turn away from sin, revelation will come to your Church leaders at the ward, stake, and general levels to call you to serve the callings that you have prepared yourself to receive as a result of your exercising your free agency in choosing to keep the commandments of the Lord. 
As an example of this process, let me share with you an experience that I had when on assignment in South America. I was asked by the brethren to divide a stake and to choose new leadership for the new stake. I realize that to some of you this may not sound like a very difficult assignment, but let me assure you that it is very, a very important responsibility. The reality was that I knew the Lord had already chosen by the process we have been discussing the man he wanted for stake president. You should know that the general authorities seek to know the mind and will of the Lord in order to, to extend on his behalf the call from him to his sons and daughters to serve. In this instance, when I arrived at the stake to begin the interviewing of the potential leaders, the current stake president advised me there were only three men who could possibly be considered to serve as the stake president. Since I do not speak nor understand Spanish, everything that was said to me had to be translated, and everything I said also needed translating. I explained to the stake president that the procedure of the Church was that I would interview all of the priesthood leaders living within the new stake. Since there were over 30 priesthood leaders to be interviewed through an interpreter, that process took considerably longer than normal. Late Saturday night, I had not found the person the Lord wanted to preside over this new stake. I reviewed once more with the current stake president all of the potential leaders. We discovered that there was one man who lived in a small district that was being incorporated into the new stake. I inquired after this man and learned that the reason he had not come in for an interview was that he was at home caring for his wife and three children who were ill. Telephone, telephone communication, as you well know, is very limited in many parts of South America. So it required sending someone out to the home of this brother, which was some distance away from where we were, to invite him to meet with me early Sunday morning. When this fine man arrived, I interviewed him, and I knew this was the man to be the new stake president. You see, he had been preparing for 34 years through the living of the gospel for this call by repenting of his sins, striving to keep the commandments of the gospel of Jesus Christ, by serving a full-time mission, by accepting responsibilities and leadership and teaching positions in the Church. The Prophet Joseph Smith taught that, quote, every man who has a calling to minister to the inhabitants of the world was ordained to that very purpose in the grand, grand councils of heaven before the world was, unquote. I believe this. It beho behooves every one of us to live as close to the teachings of the gospel as we can so we will not forfeit our foreordained opportunities to serve the Lord. I called this faithful, faithful brother to serve at 7.20 a.m. Sunday morning, knowing that the general session of the conference would begin at 10 a.m. seemed almost impossible to me how he would ever select his counselors, organize his high council, and make other calls to leadership in such a short period of time. Expressing my concern that we were under such a terrible time constraint, this wonderful man smiled, reached in to his shirt pocket, pulled out a paper, and then said to me, Brother Ballard, I'm prepared. You see, 
I was told by the Spirit last night that I would be the stake president. Here are my counselors. Here are the men I would like to be my high counsel. Here are the others to serve as leaders of the stake. The new stake was organized and the leaders sustained during the 10 o'clock a.m. session. Immediately following the general session, I set apart the leadership of the new stake. All was done through the use of interpreters and was possible because the principle of revelation directed the callings of Heavenly Father's children. There is no doubt in my mind that the principle of revelation directs the Church today. I also know that our lives are carefully observed by Heavenly Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We prepare to serve by the daily decisions we make, and these righteous decisions prepare us to fulfill the will of the Lord in helping to build the Church and Kingdom of God. Now as we embark on the new year 1986, I pray that the Lord will bless each one of us, that we might make the necessary commitments in our own lives to live worthy of our membership in the only true Church of Jesus Christ. May we prepare ourselves to serve the Lord in whatever capacity He may desire to call us. May the Lord bless each of us to repent where repentance is necessary, to choose to do the right things in life for the right reasons. In closing, I feel impressed, my brothers and sisters, to share with you another very special experience that occurred on Sunday, November 10th, in the same fourth floor council room. I am the newest special witness of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I testify to you that our Heavenly Father's will was manifest through the spirit of revelation when the Council of the Twelve unanimously sustained the ordination and setting apart of President Ezra Taft Benson as the President of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Let no one question or wonder whether or not the power of revelation is manifest in the leading councils of the Church. For I witness to you tonight that as I stood in the circle as the junior apostle and laid my hand along with the hands of the other apostles upon the head of President Benson, the confirming witness came to me that the will of the Lord was being fulfilled on that sacred occasion. This experience was another sure witness to me that God our Father does live, that Jesus Christ is His Son, that by the power of revelation the will of the Lord is made manifest in the callings of His sons and daughters to serve in the Church. May God bless every one of us here tonight that we will so live to have the Spirit of the Lord with us to help us make wise choices in the daily decisions of our lives. May you students especially be blessed to live in this world without ever succumbing to the evil practices that are so prevalent all about you. I would pray a blessing to be upon each one of you by and through the apostolic power that is mine under the ordination that I have discussed with you tonight, that you might anchor your faith and your witness of the divine mission of this Church to the mission of the Prophet Joseph Smith and to the words of the scriptures that he brought forth to us in this last day, even the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. 
You need anchors, my dear young brothers and sisters. Anchor your faith. If you are wavering for any reason, go to your knees, pick up your scriptures, study, ponder, and pray. Call down the blessings of heaven, and by the same power we've talked about this evening, the power of revelation, God will reveal to your soul the truthfulness of this great work. There are many attacks in many different parts of the earth against the Church. We've been through some difficult times in these last few months. But I suggest that times could well get much more difficult than they are now. And the anchor to your faith and the anchor to mine must be on our own personal witness, our own personal revelation that the gospel of Jesus Christ has in very fact been restored to the earth in its fullness through the prophet Joseph Smith. May I just say this much to you? I've been rereading the history of the Church. We don't know what trouble is. We just don't know what trouble is compared to the problems of the early leaders of this Church. And I submit to you that those who remained true and faithful and went forward to establish this great work on the face of the earth were those men who had testimony witnessed in their own hearts and in their own lives by the power of revelation from their own studying, their own pondering, and their own prayers. We love you. You're the future of the Church. I would pray God to bless every one of you individually in your lives. If you're troubled with something, Oh, go to Him in your prayers. If you need help, go to your bishops. Trust in the power of revelation and in the power of faith, which is the great power that moves this work forward. We love you. May God bless you individually in your lives that you'll be prepared and you'll do all that you know how to do to live your lives in such a way that you will be prepared to be chosen to serve. And this is my humble prayer that I offer on your behalf and on mine in the sacred and beloved name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.